آلی اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا محمد و آله الطاهرین اللهم صل علی محمد و آل محمد Last week we discussed about uh, the concept of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam in Islam as a concept which all Muslims believe in and accept and we discussed a few scholars who throughout the centuries had voiced their views about the tawatur of the traditions of Mahdi alayhi salam and then we uh, finished by bringing in a scholar who had doubted for the first time the idea of Mahdi and that was Ibn Khaldun who of course had not, uh, he was not a scholar of hadith he was not someone who could uh, uh, who could uh, evaluate the sources and traditions about Imam Mahdi he was a historian however due to a theory that he had put forward for the rise and fall of civilizations he said that it is not possible that Imam Mahdi who is from Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet who is from the descendants of Fatima to come at the end of the time when the solidarity, tribal solidarity is lost. This was his criticism. So it was actually his theory who uh, pushed him towards the doubts about the uh, reappearance of Imam Mahdi salam, and also his sympathy with the Fatimis who believed that already Mahdi had appeared and uh, a new line of Imam had, uh, uh, had started. Now, we want to look at another personality, which is uh, somehow contemporary, uh, living in the in late 19th and early 20th century, who is probably uh, the most prominent person who has doubted the idea of Mahdi. Again, we have to see why. He was not a historian, he was a political activist, and... Uh, uh, due to certain circumstances, he came to the conclusion that the idea of Mahdi is a detriment to Muslim community. We are not talking about Shias at the moment, we are talking about Muslim community as a whole. Now, this person is Muhammad Rashid Reza, the famous student of Muhammad Abdu. And uh, he was uh, uh, a Syrian-born a uh, scholar who was born in 1865 and died in Egypt in 1935 and is considered as one of the most influential scholars and jurists of his generation and the most prominent disciple of Muhammad Abdu. He had relations with Abdu and through him to Jamal al-Din Afghani and both of them were uh, very political, very activist, and he is actually regarded to be the inspiration for Ikhwan al Muslimin. His theories and ideas shaped the political uh, inclination and climate of Ikhwan al Muslimun in Egypt, and up till now, that is the climate, although the climate has changed a little bit. Uh, like his like Afghani and Abdu, like his teachers, Afghani and Abdu, Reza focused on the relative weakness of Muslims. This was his main concern. And if you look at the era, late 19th century, early 20th century, that was when the Muslims were as the most miserable situation. Under colonialism, they had lost their culture, their power, their dignity and everything. So we would expect activists coming who were somehow concerned about Muslim situation. He was looking after the causes. He wanted to locate the causes of weakness of Muslims uh, in the couple of centuries which went before him and afterwards, the downfall of Ottomans and all these things which happened uh, 
during his lifetime, I mean, the, the Islamic Caliphate was destroyed, the Ottoman Empire was destroyed, and so he uh, focused on the relative weakness of Muslim societies vis-a-vis -vis Western colonialism, blaming Sufi excesses. That's the whole plague and the problem that we have in the Islamic world and why we have ended up in this situation why the Europeans have come up and have taken our culture, our power of dig dignity, is because we have went down the abyss of Sufism, one thing. The blind imitation of the past, taqlid of the traditional ulama, the stagnation of the ulama, and the resulting failure to achieve progress in science and technology. These were the causes he identified as the main causes of Muslim uh, turning back, Muslims turning back uh, in their power and dignity. He held that these flaws could be recovered by a return to what he saw as the true principles of Islam. And unfortunately, the idea was very nice, the passionate sort of uh, zealous feelings about Muslim uh, dignity, it was very respectable, but what he put forward as a solution is what we see nowadays as Salafiyah. And uh, sometimes you feel you want to do something, but when you achieve that, ideas, when you realize the ideas that you are following, you see it ends up in something which is not very useful, and uh, I don't think Salafiyah has really given any uh, prominence to Muslim Ummah nowadays, and he, Salafiyah was that we have to go to the origins, to, to, to the uh, practice of Salafus Saleh, we have to leave all these things which have traditionally been accumulated as Muslim culture during centuries. Some, something like Ibn Taymiyyah, but of course a modern time Ibn Taymiyyah. And uh, politically, Reza promoted the restoration of the Caliphate, which had just crumbled before his eyes uh, after it had weakened and weakened uh, decade by decade. It is said that Hassan al-Banna and Ikhwan al-Muslimun are influenced more than anyone else by him, which is, of course, something quite uh, reasonable, acceptable. Now, one of the causes he identifies and he elaborates on in his uh, book, uh, Tafsiru Al-Minar. Al-Minar, of course, initially Al-Minar was a journal published by Afghani and Abdu, and then it was continued by Muhammad Rashid Rida. Also, Muhammad Abdu uh, started to write a Tafsir of the Quran, which he just uh, uh, passed away in the middle of Surah Baqarah. And Reza, Rashid Reza continued writing that Tafsir al-Minar up to Jaws 11, and he passed away as well. So the Tafsir is not a complete Tafsir. However, he came to places where he could direct his very, very sharp criticism to the idea of Mahdi, saying that this is the main cause that we are here at the moment. Believing in Mahdi has caused Muslims to fall in such a situation that we see today. Uh, in the ninth volume of his Tafsir, Tafsir al-Minar, under the verse 7187, Surah Al-A'raf, 100, verse 187, Yas'alunaka an mursaha, qul innama ilmuha inda rabbi, la yujalliha li waqtaha illa hu. The translation of the verse, they question you, concerning the hour, and when this is going to happen, when will it set in? Say its knowledge is only with my Lord, none except him shall manifest it at its time. It will weigh heavy on the heavens and the earth, it will not overtake you but suddenly and surprisingly. This is, of course, the verse in Surah Araf. Now, in his uh, tafsir, he starts to talk about the potence of the hour, ashratu saha, when 
The Quran says Sa'a, no one would know when it happens, but the Prophet have said that, has said that there are some signs for it. Before the Sa'a comes in, before the hour sets in, you see things which might be very amazing and uh, bewildering. Uh, that's the continuation of the translation. He provides a long discussion. You see, that's from page 462 to 507. That's about uh, uh, 45 pages. He goes in lengths, and uh, sometimes we get bored. For us, of course, these things are very, uh, very old, repetitive type of things coming up against the Zionist regime. Of course, he doesn't use the term Zionism, uh, the, the Israel, and how Jews have come and taken Muslim lands. He goes into details. It's more like a political manifest, or rather, rather than a tafsir. In many cases, when you read Tafsir al-Minar, he provides a long discussion regarding the life length of the world and brings different ideas. You know, the Bible puts the life of the whole world, the length of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the period for which the whole universe would live and continue existing to 7,000 years, something like that. And he brings views of different Muslims. And then he says there are different modern views as well about it. And different views about uh, the potence of the hour. This is where he, of course, comes to the idea. He then turns to one of these portents, which is the advent of Dajjal. He argues that the traditions in this respect, although mutawatir in meaning, so he accepts that we cannot reject the idea of Dajjal. Dajjal certainly come at the end of the time. That's one of the portents and signs of the hour. However, they are contradictory in the content and certain and con contain many Israeliyat, the traditions which have somehow penetrated to the Muslim literature through Jew converts who brought the stories of Bible into uh, the bulk of our tradition, especially through Ka'ab al-Ahbar. Hence, the details should be discarded. So this is what's what he believes. It's quite a nice idea. Every detail we have about Dajjal are just uh, accounts which we cannot rely upon. But when we put all these together, we cannot doubt about the very idea because it becomes mutawatir al-ma'nawi as we discussed last week. It's not mutawatir al-lafsi but mutawatir al-ma'nawi. So we cannot discard the idea of Dajjal. This is what he says. And it's a good, very good view. And uh, what could be known for certain about Dajjal is that the Prophet had a vision about his advent. That why, how could Prophet inform us he had a vision that he will come and all, all those things that he will do. He will appear at the end of the time, shows miracles and extraordinary powers of himself. A great number of people will be deceived by him. He's a Jew. The Muslims will fight him in the holy cities of Palestine. He says these are certain things that we know about that job. Other details we have to discard. And then uh, he turns to the traditions about Mahdi under the title التعارض والإشكالات في أحاديث المهدي Contradictions and problems in traditions regarding Mahdi alayhi salam. Now he has provided a long discussion about contradictions on, on traditions of Dajjal and then he says the, the very idea is acceptable, the details we discard. When it comes here he says now here we have more problem because the contradictions in the tradition of Mahdi is even stronger and more evident. Now, we are talking about Sunni sources of traditions of Mahdi. And to conciliate between them is more difficult. And the confusion there is more noticeable. For this reason, the two sheikhs, Bukhari and Muslim, have not paid any attention to those traditions in their Sahih books. 
This was always an argument used by Ibn Taymiyyah and people who followed suit that if anything was not discussed in Bukhari and Muslim, we discard it, although it comes through Sahih tradition. And this is a very, very, of course, flawed argument which we have to discuss somewhere else because no Sunni scholar accepted this at all and that's why they collected other traditions which were not in Bukhari and Muslim and even Bukhari himself says I have many many Sahih traditions I have a selection of them in my in my Sahih book so Bukhari said this is a selection of Sahih traditions however they they disregard that and say if they have not come in Bukhari and Muslim that means they did not regard these very seriously and uh, after his, this claim, he argues that most of the troubles, dissensions, wars, and evil innovations among Muslim nations have taken place in the name of Mahdi during the history. So what an evil idea this, has, this, this concept of Mahdi has been. That you see in Iraq, in Hejaz, in Syria, uh, in Africa, people have risen, have fought in the name of Mahdi, claiming that they were Mahdi, and look what a dissension they have created in the Muslim world. This exact idea was something which was put forward uh, a couple of years ago by Abdul Karim Surush in his uh, arguments against the concept of Mahdi in Iran. It's, it's something which has, is recurrent actually, coming up and up again. And uh, we will, of course, discuss uh, the view of other scholars about this. So, he says, what an idea this has been in the history. And also, he criticizes Muslim masses and their scholars in the way they believe in Mahdi. He says that... Uh, such a belief should have motivated them this belief in the idea of Mahdi, if it is true. He says, suppose this belief has been true. This should have motivated them to create a strong community prepared to be led by Mahdi and help him to establish justice. However, it has led them instead to total resignation and desertion of responsibility, waiting for the imminent advent of Mahdi. Phenomenologically, this is a very, very important statement. Why? Because we realize that at that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, Muslims were so disappointed because of colonial, colonization and the rise of Western civilization, the humiliation that Muslims had experienced at the hand of French and British, British and other uh, European nations, they had resignated completely and left everything for Mahdi to come and solve. And this is what he is criticizing actually. Why have you become like this? If it is true that there is a Mahdi, you should prepare yourself for his advent, not to resign completely and leave everything to the hands of destiny. Now, uh, they have, this is what it is, they have lost their might and glory, doing nothing but waiting for Mahdi to come and restores it to them. They think he will do that with his miraculous power, not with army and navy and tanks, warships and jets and bombs and rockets, as if he is even more special than the Prophet, because Prophet won his wars with weapons and army and these things, and these Muslims think that they are waiting for a miracle to come, they do not prepare themselves, and they think when Mahdi comes, he takes a sword and just kills everyone with it, no tanks, no weapons, no jets, he is actually looking at the West. This is how they have come and taken us. So we have to think in the same way. And then, uh, of course, the discussion is very long. I have just selected a few uh, statements. They do not listen to famous Ibn Khaldun. Now, he brings up Ibn Khaldun here. Who warned them that governments and civilizations are subject to laws, sunan of God. 
as is evident in the book of God and the book of creation you see in Quran and in the universe that everything is done by laws and one of those laws is that no government can persist without solidarity as Habiya is just reproducing Ibn Khaldun's theory and that solidarity is now taken away from Quraysh and the household of the Prophet by non-Arabs, Aajim. Now here we see a very pan-Arabism, pan-Arabist feeling in Rashid Reza talking about other Muslim nations with disrespect and humiliation that these are the causes of problem we Arabs have come together and do something again and uh, had they listened to him to Ibn Khaldun they would have moved in the direction of these laws and that would have given them some of what they expect from Mahdi if not all of it they do not need to wait for Mahdi they can just accomplish whatever they are waiting for uh, expecting from Mahdi, they can accomplish it by themselves. He says, in the past the Jews were deceived. This is very interesting. I, I really laughed when I was reading this. In the past the Jews were deceived as we are today by wrong interpretations of what was found in their books about the Savior Messiah who would have restored to them the kingdom of David and Solomon. They were believing these rubbish things that the ulama were telling them. And you see this Salafiyya is very strongly against the scholars and ulama of the time. And uh, uh, oops. they were doing blind taklid of their scholars in that. And for that reason they were weak and divided over centuries, the Jews. However, the later generations became aware of the laws governing civilizations as if they had read Ibn Khaldun, and they started to work towards it by creating a Jewish homeland. They applied these laws through science and technology. It shows how science and technology was showing its formidable appearance, even to people like Rashid Reza at that time. We have to judge them in their own context, of course. They apply those laws through science and technology, which they learn in Hebrew language. The language that they have spent sizable sums of money to revive. And he says, we have to learn from them to revive Arabic language and not speak to the language of Aajim anymore. And... Uh, as a contrast, Muslims have resigned and have left everything to the advent of Mahdi, thinking that he will change the laws of God while they read in the Quran that فَهَلْ يَنْذُرُونَ إِلَّا سُنَّةَ الْأَوَّلِينَ فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا وَلَنْ تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَحْوِيلًا This is clearly mentioned in the Quran do they await anything except the precedent of the ancients, the laws governing the societies and the nature? Yet you will never find any change in Allah's precedent, and you will never find any revision in Allah's precedent. So if you want glory, this is the only way, not waiting for Mahdi. Now, there are many flaws in this argument. We'll come to that later on, of course. He says they have not only done that, but have over the centuries created false Asabiya around Mahdi, which is Asabiyatul Jahiliya. They say that everyone would come round him, and instead of this Asabiyatul Arab, they have created this Asabiyatul Jahiliya. The very concept of Mahdi, Al Muntazar, he says, is a product of Al Asabiyatul Farsiyatul Majusiya. Now you see the the tone when it comes to non-Arabs. is very vehemently roused, aroused his, his feeling, very uh, excited feeling about this non-Arabs coming to Islam and these things. is a product of Al-Asabiyyatul Farsiyyatul Majusiyyat, the Persian Zoroastrian Asabiyyah. These are, have created this idea of Mahdi al Muntazar. The very people who try to de devastate the Arab Ummah and their kingdom, he's not talking now about Muslim Ummah, he's talking about Arab Ummah. This is very strange of, of Rashid Reza talking in this way, as if Islam and Arabs are identical. 
and attempted to destroy the religion which had given them that power and kingdom in the past. Well, he forgot that that power and kingdom was built on civilizations of Egypt and Iran and all the hard work of that civilization was done by, by these uh, uh, expertise which were product of these civilizations. Anyhow, we don't want to go into such details. We are just talking about Mahdi at the moment. We have a lot to discuss with uh, Rashid Reza in this vein. Then he tries to show the contradiction of tradition about Mahdi. Contradictions in traditions. However, what he provides is a bunch of traditions and historical accounts which demonstrate a disagreement in the person of the Mahdi and not in the concept of the Mahdi. That's a completely different issue. That who, is, who Mahdi is is a completely different issue. He fails to reject or to show the uh, difficulty in traditions about the concept of Mahdi, so he goes to traditions about the person of Mahdi. That there are lots of contradictions here. Rashid Reza come back to the issue again in the next volume, uh, while explaining the verse 32 of Surah Tawbah. Yuriduna in yutfu nur Allah bi'afwahihim. They desire to put out the light of God with their mouths, but God is intent perfecting his light. Now, this is one of the verses which has been put forward as a, a prediction about the advent of Mahdi Because he will complete his light. This would not happen unless someone could completely... Uh, illuminate this light in the whole world and in the heart of everyone. So the exegetes, not Shia exegetes, we are now talking about the sunny world, have actually mentioned that this verse is only realized at the time of Mahdi. Now, after examining different possibilities of the fulfillment of this promise, he continues, and some scholars believe that, such as Sunni scholars, this Good tiding is only fulfilled at the end of the time by the advent of Mahdi, followed by the dis descent of Jesus. However, he opines, the spread of this idea among Muslims has been the main cause of their backwardness and for shirking their responsibility in implementing the Sharia and supporting the Da'wah and establishing its sovereignty. It's very interesting because the idea of Mahdi in Iran, just before the revolution, had the same contention. Co had caused the same contention. Some people said that we have to do nothing, we just wait for Mahdi to come, because before Mahdi nothing could be set right. And some people, some others said, no, we have to do Amr al Ma'ruf, Nahi al Munka, we are, we are not going to take Mahdi's place, but we have our own duties to do. And the same thing here, apparently, the same sort of climate was existing in the Sunni world, as we have it in the Shia world as well. However, relying on future unseen things, he says, would not discharge them. He says that relying on future unseen things would not discharge them of their present obligations. Well, no one would deny that. He refers his readers to his above-mentioned discussion and says, we mentioned in tafsir of Surah Al-Araf that the traditions about Mahdi are contradictory and none of them are sound. Now, this is a new claim. It's, uh, all these traditions originate from a well-known Shi'i political drive this is the most novel suggestion in the scholarly world of Ahl-Sunnah, that the, the traditions of Mahdi is a creation of, of Shias. This is something that no scholar, no Sunni scholar would ever ask, accept. However, he puts this forward, and because the Shias were not Arabs, as he thought, thinking that Shia originated from Iran and uh, non-Arab places, he very, of course, daringly put, this, put forward this idea. 
And uh, the Jews, for thousands of years, for thousands of years, were relying on such a concept to restore Palestine for themselves, on the concept of Messiah. And when they saw the futility of that, they utilized the British government to help them and achieve their goal. So, if British government can do the job for, of Mahdi or Messiah, why should we wait for Mahdi? We also should find some power to do the job of Messiah. The type of thinking about Mahdi that he comes to somehow give prominence to one nation, the, the Jewish type of uh, messianic thoughts, that Messiah will come and give prominence to Jews and in, at the expense of everyone else, he thought that, well, we are waiting for Mahdi to come to give prominence to Arabs at the expense of everyone else. If the Jews could do it with the help of British government, why not we do it with the help of some other, other powers? Well, of course, he doesn't say that explicitly, but this is what uh, the, the tone of the argument would tell us. He woefully concludes that, are we not more deserved to preserve the remnant of our territory, considering their small number and our huge population, the Jews' small number and our huge population. So why have they been able to do it? And we haven't done it yet. Now, of course, I don't think the idea or the criticism carries such a weight to be worthwhile to even criticize it from the social perspective. Yeah, of course, when he says the traditions of Mahdi are a creation, fabrication of Shias, when he says the traditions of Mahdi are all contradictory and baseless, none of them are sound, then that needs a response. But other views, we know that this is the past century. These people lived in their times and we live in our times. Now we can realize, understand the world in a different, uh, different light, certainly. However, the response to Rashid Reza, the response about, not about what he has claimed, that if we go for some power we can replace him, it's for Mahdi, alayhi salam. The scholar response, I want to bring this response from uh, the uh, most prominent contemporary Sunni scholar of Hadith, who is an undisputed authority in this field, someone who, when his name is mentioned, everyone says, yes, that is the highest authority in Sunni Hadith. And this is a man called Muhammad Nasiruddin Al-Albani, who passed away in 1999. He, is, he was, of course, a scholar from Albania, who then moved to Turkey and had his studies there, and moved to Medina, to Hejaz, to many different centers of learning, and uh, there is no dispute about his authority. He was an important and influential Islamic scholar of the 20th century, specializing in the field of hadith and fiqh, and author of more than 300 books in the field. And uh, Abdul Aziz bin Baz, you know him of course, he, the late Mufti of Saudi Arabia, uh, considered him the mujaddad of this period. You know, there is a Sunni idea at, that at the, at the uh, turning point of every century there is a mujaddid, someone who comes and revives the religion. And someone like Ben Baz regarded Al-Albani to be the mujaddid because of his hard work and very critical, accurate, scholarly uh, writings on Sunni Hadith, of course. Uh, he said about him, I have not seen under the surface of the sky a man more knowledgeable in hadith. This is what Ben Ba says about Al-Albani. In our time, in our current time, than the greatest scholar 
محمد ناصر الدین الالبانی ناو In an article in the journal At-Tamaddun al-Islami, provided on his personal website, he has a personal website, you can go to his website as well, of course it's in Arabic. Al-Albani writes that Rashid Raza not only rejects the traditions about Mahdi but also denies three other concepts which are even more firmly established in our traditions. That is the advent of Dajjal, the descent of Jesus, and the intercession of the Prophet on the Day of Judgment. Any view which had some sort of vicinity to Shia faith, Rashid Reza rejected. And one of them was the Shafa, of course, which uh, is very strange, because no Muslim scholar can deny the concept of Shafa of the Prophet on the Day of Judgment. It is one of the necessities of Islamic faith, however he rejected them. No blame, because he was not a scholar, he was an activist, and activists usually bring up, out views which are, put up views which are not very scholarly, certainly, and not very accurate. Now, traditions on all these concepts, he says, are both sound and mutawatir, on Shafa'a, on descent of Isa, salam, on Dajjal, and on Mahdi. On all these concepts, he says, traditions are sound and mutawatir. Sound is sahih, is tradition which is accepted as sahih. Regarding Mahdi, he says, the sound traditions are abound. The sound traditions abound, sorry, R is redundant here. Of which he provides four examples. Now, the, the four examples are very interesting because he wants to bring traditions in which no person is ever in the imagination of any scholar of hadith have been close by 100,000 miles to Shiism. He wants to bring people who are completely away from Shiism. This is what he brings in his chains about Mahdi. He says that hadith, the first hadith, hadith of Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anh, لو لم يبق من الدنيا إلا يوم لطول الله ذلك اليوم حتى يبعث فيه رجلا مني أو من أهل بيتي يواطئ اسمه اسمي واسم أبيه اسم أبي يملأ الأرض قسطا وعدلا كما ملأ الثلما وجورا This is the main tradition which is almost متواتر from the Prophet Ibn Mas'ud If not even if nothing is left from the life of this world but one day, Allah would extend the length of that day until he would send a man from me or from my Ahlul Bayt. This is, of course, the Rawi is hesitating. His name is my name. His father's name is my father's name. Of course, this is one of the discrepancies between Shia Hadith and Sunni Hadith because Sunni Hadith says that his father's name is my father's name. He will fill the earth with justice and equity after it has been filled with oppression and injustice. This is the Hadith. And this, Yamla'ul Arda Qistan wa Adla Kamamula Dhulman wa Jawra, is something which you find in many, many traditions. He says this hadith is reported by Abu Dawood, Tarmadi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Tabarani, Abu Nu'aym, Khatib al-Baghdadi, from Zarr ibn Huwaysh to Ibn Mas'ud, and Tarmadi, one of the authors of the Sahah, says, Hasanun Sahihun. This is a sound hadith. Then, and Zahabi also says this is Sahih hadith. The second hadith, he, the same hadith he gives from a different chain. From Ali ibn Abi Talib, of course you, you, you don't criticize that I just said no she is in the chain of these traditions and you say well, what about Ali ibn Abi Talib? They don't regard Ali ibn Abi Talib to be a Shi'i. So, Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu an, marfu'an nahwahu. The same thing Ali reports from the Prophet and there are two chains for this tradition. And the first chain is reported by Abu Dawood, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, sound chain. 
And the other one, Ibn Majah, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, a very good chain. Now, this is a scholarly discussion. This is not a social discussion anymore. This is not activist sort of discussion. It's a very dry scholarly discussion about the traditions of Mahdi. The third hadith from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Actually, he brings four of the companions of the Prophet. Of course, two companions, one wife of the Prophet, that these have reported these, and it has reached us through many different chains from these people. And there are, of course, two different chains to the tradition of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, Tarmazi ibn Majah, Hakim al-Nayshaburi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Tarmazi says, very good hadith, Hakim says, Sahih according to conditions of Muslim, and Zahabi agrees with him, and the second one is uh, from Abu Dawood and Hakim, and he has said that it's Sahih. The fourth companion who has reported this, Umm Salama, wife of the Prophet. And he says that in a book about Sahih and Hadith, and Zaif, I've written in Hadith, I have given a long discussion of the chain of this one tradition from Umm Salama. So, thank you very much. What we have here is uh, what he accepts from another scholar, Siddiq Hassan Khan. He quotes his views here. He says that the traditions on Mahdi, despite their nuances, are abundant, meeting the criteria of Tawatur. Now, this is not an ordinary man talking like this. Of course, he is the highest authority. He criticizes Ibn Khaldun for disapproving all the traditions, hinting that he was not a muhaddis, but a researcher. He was just like a student in this field, not a real scholar of hadith. He continues, the traditions on Mahdi are a mixture of sound and weak hadith, and the concept was very well known and accepted by all Muslims in all time. And that is why people tried to rise in the name of Mahdi. Of course, when uh, Rashid Rizwa says that this has been the cause of fitna, that people have used this concept and have created bloodshed, this is against him because this shows that everyone was aware of this concept of Mahdi and they were trying to use it for their political aims. He gives a summary of well-known beliefs about Mahdi which are as follows. Now, this is the Sunni, the core of Sunni belief about Mahdi. It is very important. He is from Ahlul Bayt. Appears at the end of the time, supporting faith and establishing justice. Muslims will follow him and he concurs all Muslim territory. He is called Mahdi. Dajjal and other portents of the hour will appear with or after his appearance. Jesus descends after him and kills Dajjal. Jesus prays behind him. That's all. These are the non-controversial beliefs about Mahdi in the Sunni world. Al-Albani criticizes Rashid Reza and Ibn Khaldun for not investigating traditions one by one and for not searching for multitudes of chains of transmissions recorded for each hadith. Just rejecting an idea on the basis of some theories. Had they done that, they would have found proof which would normally confirm those elements of creed which could not be confirmed by but by Tawatur. Al-Albani states that most evident proof, the most evident proof that Rashid Rida had not investigated the traditions is his claim that in every chain of such tradition at least one Shia reported could be found. This is what Rashid Rida says. And he says this is not the case. It's, and of course then he goes to a sort of ecumenical discussion here. He says that uh, in the four examples mentioned about no Shia reporter is registered, 
Well, except Ali ibn Abi Talib for us. And uh, although he adds the existence of Shia reporters in the chain would not harm the soundness of tradition, this comes now from a just a scholar. Because both Shia and Sunni scholars believe that the existence of a Sunni scholar in the chain of transmission would not harm the Hadith if they are honest. And the Sunnis believe the existence of a Shia reporter would not harm the tradition if they are honest. He, this is what he says. He adds the existence of Shia reporters in the chain would not harm the soundness of tradition so long as they are confirmed to be honest and having good memory. This is the only condition. This, he says, is a well-established fact in Elmul Hadith. And that is why the two sheikhs, Bukhari and Muslims, have reported in their Sahih books traditions from Shias as well as followers of other sects. If that was the case, if this is why you reject the hadith, because there is a Shia in the chain of transmission, you are rejecting the conditions and the standards of Bukhari and Muslims and everyone else. And also, now, I quickly go through these, I have not translated these, because the article is long. He says that uh, uh, some of the scholars have said that these traditions are all wrong because uh, believing in that would mean, as Rashid Reza said, that they have to rely on the appearance of Mahdi and they leave all sorts of efforts and work uh, and action in their lifetime and they think that by wiping the concept of Mahdi, Muslims would move and act. And he says this is not the case. I mean, uh, uh, the ahadith of Mahdi does not in any way hint that Muslims should leave their duty at any time. That's something about the future. That's something theological about eschatology of this world. It's nothing to do with the present duty of Muslims at all. This is uh, uh, what he says Rashid Rida does not understand. And uh, he says that Rashid Reza says that the idea of Mahdi has caused lots of problems and many people have claimed to be Mahdi and that's why we have to reject it. He says many people during this year have claimed to be God. Should you reject the idea of God because many people have claimed to be God? Certainly not. Many people have claimed, for example, uh, to have uh, gone to... Uh, he, he says that... Ahmad Qadiani, that Jalul Hind, has actually uh, resorted to this idea. But this is not something that for, uh, for the sake of it we reject the, the main idea. He also says that, look at the history of Muslims, how they have, by believing in Qadha and Qadr, which is something mentioned in the Quran, they believed in Jabr and predetermination. While predetermination, this is a Sunni scholar saying it, predetermination is rejected by our rational understanding. Predetermination in the sense of, uh, in the sense of human action, that we are forced to do whatever we do. He says, but we cannot reject qaza and qadar, the idea of qaza and qadar. But we have to understand it rightly and correctly. And the idea of Mahdi, we have to understand it correctly, not giving false interpretation to it and saying that since this has caused false interpretation, then we reject it completely. This is what he says in conclusion. The belief in the advent of Mahdi. Is a belief which has been established by Tawatur from the Prophet, peace be on him. Believing in it is wajib, yajib al imanu baha, li'annaha min umur al ghayb, because this belongs to the realm of ghayb, while imanu baha min sifat al muttaqin, believing in it is one of the attributes of muttaqin, kama qala ta'ala, alif lam mim dhalik al kitab, la rayba fi hudan lil muttaqin. الذين يؤمنون بالغيب وإن إنكارها لا يصدر إلا من جاهل أو مكابر to deny this would not come 
accept denial of this would not come except from an ignorant person or a person who does not accept reason and argument. Okay, this is uh, uh, the end of this. Of course, I wanted to include a couple of other Shi'i people. I don't say scholars because, of course, there are scholars, but the scholars not in this field. Uh, who had doubted the idea, but I think that would be enough, because the response would be the same response. Whatever they have said is not more than whatever Rashid Reza has said. It's just a diluted form of what Rashid Reza has said, except when we come to the concept of the, the, the person of Mahdi, then some Shias have created, have put forward some arguments doubting that Mahdi is Hujatib. Al Hassan, Ibn al Hassan al Askari, then we discuss it there. So we are done with doubts about Mahdi alayhi salam, and inshallah we continue.